Buongiorno a tutti, welcome everybody. Uh, comincio con l'italiano, poi farò una breve traduzione. Benvenuti alla prima presentazione della nuova stagione di Archive Online Academy, che si apre quest'anno con uh, tre presentazioni di um, progetti e, uh, e ricerche attinenti all'attività di Archive, il centro di eccellenza uh, basato a Venezia e um, che uh, è frutto del, della partnership tra Fondazione Giorgio Cini di Venezia, Factum Foundation e uh, EPFL e, um, e che appunto anche quest'anno uh, propone dei uh, percorsi formativi in linea con uh, le attività uh, di Archive e dei suoi partner. A small translation, a brief translation in, in English. Welcome to the first uh, presentation of Archive Online Academy. This year, uh, there will be also some presentation of projects and research uh, of um, Archive, Archive team, uh, founded in 2018 uh, by uh, its uh, partners, that are Fondazione Giorgio Cini di Venezia, Uh, Factum Foundation and EPFL. Um, I switch again to Italian. Uh, oggi uh, cominciamo con uh, una presentazione uh, a noi particolarmente cara. Carlos Bajod Lucini uh, ci parlerà della digitalizzazione dell'isola di San Giorgio um, e delle collezioni della Fondazione Giorgio Cini tramite uh, tecniche di uh, di acquisizione eh, 3D, quindi beni tridimensionali e beni culturali tridimensionali. Carlos Bayod è eh, project manager per Factum Foundation e, e quindi eh, è la persona più adatta per eh, spiegare, eh, mostrare gli esiti, ma anche spiegare le tecnologie utilizzate per questo progetto che vede appunto Fondazione Cini e Uh, Factum Foundation, partner in questa, in questa bellissima impresa, ovvero quella appunto della digitalizzazione uh, della fondazione dell'isola di San Giorgio, uh, beni mobili e immobili. I admit more people, sorry. <laughs> Well, uh, Carlos Bayod Lucini is the project manager, project manager at Factum Foundation, and um, he is, uh, uh, today we'll talk about the digitization of the island of San Giorgio Maggiore in Venice and of uh, Fondazione Cini uh, collections uh, with the uh, 3D techniques, 3D and 2D, but he will explain better uh, soon. Um, for cultural heritage. Uh, the project of digitizing the islands and the collections uh, of Fondazione Cini is, um, of course, a project that we are really glad to present today. And uh, we are working together, I mean, Fondazione Giorgio Cini and Factum, for this great result. Factum Foundation uh, takes care of the uh, technical part, as you you will discover very soon. Um, well, Carlos, I don't, I don't want to <laughs> take more time, too much time from your presentation. So welcome again. And well, uh, I didn't say this. And if everybody has questions, you are kindly invite to uh, write them down, both on YouTube or on Zoom. And, and well, I will try to read them all from both uh, channels and, and ask the questions to, to Carlos. Grazie. Thank you, Costanza. Can you hear me well? Very well. Um, okay, buongiorno a tutti. Uh, thank you very much for being here. Um, And, and of course, thank you for inviting me to, to discuss uh, these projects with you and to share the work that we are doing in Archive. Um, I will share my screen now. Um, 
One moment. In the meantime, I remember to all attendants that um, you can check again the presentation on, on YouTube. I send you the link, the YouTube link uh, to, to see the presentation also, uh, well, in the future, <laughs> in the next future. And, and well, we can see it pretty well. Great, fantastic. So uh, as I was saying, thank you very much for, uh, to everyone for being here. Um, I will try to explain a summary of what we are doing actually right now in the last weeks, in the last months in archive. And um, I just want to, I want to begin by saying that these projects are um, a clear example of how this collaboration works between Factum Foundation, the Chini Foundation and EPFL. The work of archive, as you know, and, um, analysis and recording of cultural heritage in Venice, this initiative that we created a few years ago, it's about how to promote the use of digital technology for preserving uh, cultural heritage, art uh, works of art in general, not only in Venice, but at a global scale. But in order to try to explain to the world how we work, we always try to apply these ideas and these concepts into uh, preserving the actual cultural patrimony of the island of San Giorgio. We want to do this as an example of what is possible to be done today with uh, existing technology, with new recording technologies, and how can this be applied maybe to the whole of the, of the city of Venice or to other sites in Italy or around the world. So today I want to explain what we have been doing uh, about digitizing specific architectural um, and artistic elements that you can find in the island of San Giorgio Maggiore. So this island is really a treasure. You can find unique things. Um, and we are trying to apply the real cutting edge 3D and 2D recording technologies to capture what is important of this uh, object, of this um, Beni Culturali. No? I'm going to focus on the work that we have been doing specifically uh, since we started uh, this new year, 2022, we started working in the Teatro Verde, which is one of the main landmarks in San Giorgio. We were also working in digitizing the Vatican chapels, which are a series of pavilions that they were supposed to be temporary, but they, are, they can still be visited on the island. And then we were also looking at one of the important tapestries in the Chini collection. So as you can see, I will be discussing how we understand the use of non-contact recording technologies to objects of different scales, different sizes, um, but all with the same general idea of capturing uh, the shape, the surface and the color with the highest possible resolution so we can keep a proper archive of how these elements are today and how can they be preserved, at least digitally, for the future. Um, in order to do these projects, we really used the help of the staff of the Chini Foundation and the staff of Archive in particular. So working with uh, Constanza, with Ilenia, with, um, with Chiara, everything has been very easy and very uh, straightforward because as you will see, each of these projects require some complex organization, some infrastructure that uh, involves a lot of people. And uh, it was necessary to have a very clear communication to make them possible. These elements, the Teatro Verde, the um, Vatican chapels, uh, you can learn a lot about them through the Chini Foundation website. There's a lot of information and probably there will be links about um, how to visit these spaces in specific uh, times, in specific days. And there's also information in the website about the art collection of the, of the Chini Foundation. I, I will be focusing today on one of the tapestries that was part of this recording. 
If you have been following this series of the online academy, you will see that uh, last year we were also presenting to you the work that we were doing for recording in three dimensions the entire island of San Giorgio. So we were explaining how we were using different 3D recording technologies like uh, LIDAR scanning, photogrammetry, etc., to record, to obtain a 3D archive of the different spaces around the island outside and inside of the buildings and uh, looking at those elements that are important to define what uh, is the island of San Giorgio today. We started this work back in 2020 and uh, sending a team from Factum, working with a team from the EPFL, we were, as I'm saying, uh, recording uh, basically the entire island, starting with the main monuments, with the Church of uh, San Giorgio Maggiore, with the cloister by Palladio, the uh, Scala di Longhena, all these different elements were recorded in 3D with different um, levels of uh, resolution. We were not recording everything in super high resolution. We were trying to establish hierarchies and determine what is important at what scale for each part of the island. So, for example, if we are talking about the, the cloister itself, it was very interesting to look not only at the general um, volumetric recording, but also to focus on some uh, specifically detail of some areas so that we could actually monitor how certain uh, elements on the walls, of the plaster walls, they were being uh, changed uh, over the time. So this idea of monitoring something over time, over the years, it is very important to this uh, uh, mission of recording cultural heritage. It's not just about presenting just a snapshot of how something looks right now, but it is also really important and increasingly essential to be able to keep an archive of how things evolve, especially in a city like Venice, in which everything is so dynamic and changing completely in relation to the, to the lagoon. Within the um, monumental complex of San Giorgio Maggiore, we were also looking into the interiors of some of the buildings and recording specific works of art, like um, paintings, sculptures, uh, manuscripts, of course, which is mainly one of the main parts of the work by archive. We were looking at architectural elements. All of these images I am showing you now are like uh, cloud points. They are like um, the 3D data that we obtain out of the different scans. And then it is possible to establish different measures or different, um, different outputs of this information, for example, like um, um, drawings, like architectural drawings or ortho images or 3D models, all these different outputs are just uh, examples of what is possible to do with the information. But the essential thing is to be able to at least record, keep a, a proper archive of the raw information before any processing. This image, for example, is the space where part of the collection of tapestries is being uh, located. So it will be important to go back to this uh, in a minute. So this is what we have been doing in the last two years, trying to work around the different buildings um, on the island. But there were other parts on the island that were not recorded at that time. So between 2020 and this year, 2022, we could um, we had time to process what we recorded before, and then we started figuring out how to do new recordings to complete the full archive of the island. The Teatro Verde, it was a, an obvious choice because it has been uh, recently restored in a very ambitious project so that it is now again, since this spring, open to the public. People were able to visit the Teatro Verde, which is a very unique structure created in, in the 50s and 1950s. And um, people now visiting San Giorgio Maggiore are allowed to uh, experience this space and new activities, I'm sure they will be prepared for this um, outdoors amphitheater. These are the technologies on the screen. You can see the different systems that we used for recording this uh, monument. As in many of the works, we were always combining not just 
we were not just using one, but combining different technologies. So in the case of the Teatro, we were using LIDAR 3D scanning. We were using photogrammetry, just um, handheld with the camera on hand. And then we were also using photogrammetry from a drone. So by combining these different approaches, that's what we believe it is needed to have a proper record of the current situation of this structure. These are just images of the, of the space captured uh, also from the drone. And I'm, I will show you very quickly some images of the process. So basically our colleagues from Factum started working last January. Um, it was a good time because there were no visits yet to the theater. Uh, there were no uh, abundance of leaves on the, on the trees. So all these um, elements are in favor for a good recording. What you can see on the screen now is, is a LiDAR scanner. It's a 3D scanner that basically it's uh, capable of obtaining point clouds. It's uh, determining the positions of points in space, especially by changing the different uh, locations of the scanner throughout the space, inside and outside. And with this information, by doing a series of positions with some overlap between them. So in this uh, screenshot, for example, you can see a floor plan of the theater and you can actually see that each blue point is representing one of the positions in which the scanner was placed in order to capture one individual scan. Each 3D scan is then combined into one complete, uh, let's say, composition of all the scans, as long as there's enough overlap in between. And then, again, some uh, screenshots of the uh, work in progress. This is the type of information that it is possible to obtain before any further processing. So what I'm showing here is just the initial raw uh, information captured by the scanner. As you can see, we are talking about points in space, but also some color information. Although in this case, the color information is mainly for uh, reference purposes. It's not, it's not that we are using this for any particular um, application. It's just we are interested here in recording the general shape of the architectural space. We are interested on recording what is the relation between the theater with its um, immediate surrounding on the island so that in an ideal situation, we would be able to go back to this place, let's say in five or 10 years time, 20 years time, and then a second recording will be able to tell us if these uh, elements have been changing somehow. So using the LiDAR scanner, which is uh, it's a pretty common scanner that is used for architectural measurements, for recording urban spaces, landscape, etc. It was possible to go over the different areas in the theater, not only outside, but also inside, because underneath the stage, there is also um, a bit of an important space that defines the actual building. So we were also looking into how could we record these service spaces um, just in order to have a model as complete as possible. So it is because of this that um, coordination with the staff at the Chini Foundation, especially the team in charge of the recent restoration, has been essential because it is about, uh, as we process this information, we will be talking to them about what is the type of data that will be important for them to have in order to complement their drawings, for example, in order to look at specific details in 3D um, that it is thanks to this type of recording that it is possible to obtain. The use of the drone is something that we are increasingly uh, employing for recording, especially outdoors areas. You use the drone when you want to capture with photogrammetry um, an entire area uh, from a certain height. So photogrammetry, as you might know, is uh, is that technique for obtaining 3D information of an object or a terrain, any area, by taking multiple photographs uh, from different points of view, from different distances. And then through specific 3D software, it is possible to interpret these images and aligning them, and then 
converting this information into 3D data. So this is just a, a diagram of the type of uh, itinerary that we um, prepared for the drone to do on top of the area of this theater. This is something that we created uh, automatically. So it is possible with the drone to tell exactly what is gonna be the itinerary that it will follow. Uh, of course, the height and the angle in which the camera from the drone will be shooting. So for example, in this area of the theater, we were establishing like a grid so that the drone will be going in rows and columns, recording in uh, parallel um, paths, the full area of the theater. And then from a height of about 25 meters, shooting with the photo camera uh, in two sessions, both at 90 degrees, that is perfectly vertical, or with a slight angle of 75 degrees. Um, apart from that, then we were doing also manual flights. So just uh, flights of the drone controlled manually and the shots of the pictures controlled manually from, from a closer distance, just from a height of about 10 meters in order to be able to get even higher resolution. Thanks to this type of recording, and uh, of course the trees is something that we cannot avoid because the last uh, recordings were being done just a, a couple of weeks ago is not the same as when we were the first time in the winter time in this case uh, of course the you know nature is more evident here but uh, it will be possible to complement what we were recording in january with the data obtaining now in may and june um at the same time, we were using similar technology. Uh, so LiDAR scanning and photogrammetry, both terrestrial and aerial, for recording the Vatican chapels and the area around it. So basically they are a series of pavilions. Uh, it's a total of 10 pavilions that were designed as uh, contemporary chapels uh, back in 2018. And this was the first time that the, the Vatican, like the Holy See, was actually participating in the architectural Biennale with a pavilion on its own. Uh, so by creating this series of uh, chapels, each of them designed by one architect, it was possible to create this uh, itinerary in which uh, visitors to the fantastic gardens in San Giorgio could go from one chapel to another and see just the approach of each specific architect uh, to, this, um, to this idea. The 10 chapels, as you can see, they are completely different, each of them in shape, in materials, uh, textures, the way people experience them is very different among the different uh, designs. And in some of them, you can go inside and experience you know, the landscape from the filter of the chapel. In some other cases, it's more like to experience the, 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 the design only from outside. So the idea of recording all these chapels, it's something that uh, it's directly related to keeping a proper archive of how these shapes are uh, in the present. We don't know how long, for how long these uh, pavilions will, will be still on the island, maybe at some point they will be removed or maybe some of them will change somehow. So we felt also in conversations with the Chini, it was really important to keep a proper 3D scanning archive of, uh, the, of the pavilions. The Vatican Chapel's idea, it's, uh, it was inspired by uh, Gunnar Asplund's um, chapel in the woods from 1920s. So following this idea of uh, isolated specific uh, small scale buildings for worship or for praying, then this idea of uh, having 10 new chapels in the woodlands of San Giorgio, it, uh, it emerged. In addition to the 10 chapels, there was also this, uh, what they call Asplund Pavilion. So in a way, like a homage to this, um, uh, this first pavilion from last century that gave way to the idea. So at the end, it made a total of 11 small buildings that we have to record. And again, the approach was about combining different techniques. It was about using 
the combination of um, the LIDAR scanning. As you can see, our colleague Pedro Miro uh, moving the LIDAR scanning on the tripod around the different chapels, following, of course, on the interior of them, but also the immediate surroundings. And then also with photogrammetry for capturing those parts of the textures, let's say the materials of the walls, certain elements on the floors, the ceilings, etc., that required maybe higher resolution. Some elements in these chapels are, let's say, very straightforward. When we are talking about uh, solid surfaces, matte finishings, like in this chapel, uh, it is relatively easy to obtain good information. So these images, again, they are not final results. This is just images of the work in progress that we are doing to process all this information. But in other cases, the chapels were made with uh, some specific materials that were in a way harder to record with these technologies. So when you are trying to record glass surface, for example, or any other transparent or translucent material, it is really not possible to be done with uh, conventional 3D scanning systems. Or if we were trying to record elements that are made of metal, very shiny, very reflective metal, uh, it is also something that it is not uh, made for this type of technologies. So in cases in which capturing the texture of the chapels itself, it was going to be problematic, it was decided to focus more specifically on recording what is the relation of the chapels to the environment around it. Because the location and the orientation of each of the chapels it's made with a purpose. There is a reason for that. So if in the future, this series of installations are removed forever, it should be important not only to have records of the shape of each individual chapel, but also what was the distance between them? What was the relation in the landscape in between the different pavilions? And this is why the recording was not just about capturing each object in particular, but also the relation in between them. Um, some other examples of the type of data we were capturing. So these are just pre-alignments in which you can see that in some cases it is easier than others to have a proper record of the 3D shape of the, um, of the chapels. Out of this type of information, it is possible to extract 3D drawings, sorry, 3D models, um, architectural drawings like elevations, floor plans, uh, cross cuts, etc. That would require further uh, processing. But at least the important thing is to be able to record the things how they are right now. Uh, then it is almost infinite, the things you can do to the data, depending on what is required for dissemination, for research, or for preservation. You can see in an image like this one that when it was possible, for example, in this pavilion by Soto de Moura that is made in stone, it is essential not only to record the general shape of the thing, but also to be able to capture some elements of the texture of the walls. Similar to the images that I was showing you at the beginning of the walls in the cloister in, in San Giorgio. Uh, in this case, the texture of the specific uh, stone that was chosen for this pavilion, it was part of the important things to, to capture in the scanning. And then, again, this is work in progress. It will take um, some weeks, uh, some months to, to process all this information and extract different output for different applications. But um, if there's something I would like just to communicate with this idea is that at the end, any uh, project in which it is necessary to obtain 3D information out of, um, let's say, um, architectural spaces, architectural elements, buildings in general, it is normally about using a combination of different techniques with a combination also of different resolutions. It is not just about choosing one specific technique. It's about defining a strategy in which you can establish, okay, I'm going to be using this technique in combination with that because with this one I will be obtaining, let's say, higher precision, but with this one I will be obtaining higher resolution. So this uh, 
planification, this strategic approach, it's important for complex objects like this one. Thanks to the experience by Factu of digitizing all kinds of different objects, and also thanks to what Archive represents, which is about how to propose new methods and new ways of applying technology for cultural heritage, this research is possible and it's possible uh, made from a practical point of view. So we are discovering new um, approaches and new methodologies as we are practicing with them on site. The whole area, not only the theater, but also the whole, the whole area of the garden where the chapels are located was also recorded again with uh, aerial photogrammetry from the drone, defining some automatic uh, itineraries for the drone with different flights at, diff at different heights and different angles. And then also using manual flights at uh, eight or 10 meters high for recording the roofs of the different pavilions, especially those areas of the chapels in which it was not possible to access from, from the floor level. So all this data, data then will be gathered together and it will be used to compose a general model of this entire place. So you can have at the same time a general view like this one in which everything is recorded in its precise position. And then also it will be possible to go further and closer into each of the chapels and then maybe go as close as to understand the different textures of the wall or the different specific details of the architectural design. Uh, so this uh, trip or these uh, transitions between scales, between sizes and between resolutions, it's possible thanks to this um, uh, holistic approach that I am trying to summarize here. In total, from the drone, uh, we were flying it around a total of 24 hours of flight of recording, obtaining about 9,000 raw pictures that have to be processed and aligned together afterwards. The third element that we were capturing in this spring, it's um, this tapestry, which is uh, one of the main examples of the, one of the main pieces of the tapestry collection of the, of the Chini Foundation. In this case, we are talking about a very different approach. We were looking at a resolution of uh, under one millimeter. We are now talking about sub millimeter recording. And we are trying to look at uh, exactly what is the specific texture and color on, of the tapestry that will allow a proper archive for information in case it was necessary to carry out conservation uh, process on it. The Lucida 3D scanner, it's the system that uh, is part of Archive Studio, and it is what is normally uh, applied for recording the surface of paintings or the surface of low relief objects in general. And then composite photography, it's actually the um, technique of obtaining hundreds of small high resolution photographs of a surface in order to compose one single file in very high resolution, but considering this as a flat color information, not with the idea of following a photogrammetric uh, process. I will explain you more in detail how these two different techniques are combined together. But first, a little bit of background. Um, maybe some of you remember that uh, about 10 years ago, the uh, Fondazione Giorgio Cini created this uh, exhibition, Penelope's Labor, Weaving Words and Images. It was a very um, experimental show because tapestries made by contemporary artists like uh, Mark Quinn, Grayson Perry, uh, Manuel Franquello, etc. They were put on display as an example of uh, the present, the contemporary technique of tapestry making. And they were shown together with um, historical tapestries that were also part of the Chini collection. So for example, uh, this one, the Siege of Jerusalem, which is uh, one of the main 
elements is that in, on the tapestry collection at the Chini, it's one that was on show in Penelope's labor. We are talking about the tapestry from the end of 15th century. So it was very interesting to see the contrast between the subjects and the materiality and the techniques used then with those used now in 21st century from a contemporary art point of view. Another of the tapestries, another of the contemporary tapestries that was on display in this exhibition, it was uh, Manuel Frankelos Palimpsest and Palindrome. It was a tapestry that was woven uh, in both sides at the same time. So it's not just two tapestries put together. It was woven from the beginning because it was designed like that to have two sides, a front and the back. The images that are represented in the tapestry are actually, um, let's say, representations of another type of technological development that, that was taking place at the time in Factum, which is the actually the development of the Lucida 3D scanner. You can see, for example, on the top part of your screens, one side of the uh, tapestry was containing like a series of um, diagrams, um, close pictures, um, a combination of different um, schemes that were actually necessary for developing this technology, for developing this 3D scanner from scratch. The other side of the tapestry was showing like a render of the type of information that it's possible to obtain with this uh, scanner, which is 3D information of low relief surfaces without the color in which the texture is something that is captured uh, with the highest possible detail. So this uh, tapestry was representing in itself innovation at various levels, not only in the way that it's a double-sided tapestry, but also in the subject. The tapestry was actually an installation in which we were projecting these uh, lines of white light. These lines were being projected directly onto the dark part of the tapestry from two projectors. And the idea of these lines, these moving lines that were in a way like dancing on top of the black background, it's because the scanner actually works this way by projecting a uh, line of laser on top of the surface. The creator, I mean, the, let's say the, um, the person who really created the scanner, Manuel Franquelo, who is an artist and an engineer, um, created a series of prototypes in which the hardware and software, everything was uh, thought from the beginning to create a 3D scanner specifically for cultural applications, specifically for recording paintings and other works of art. So this scanner, which is actually called the Lucida scanner, it works by projecting a line of laser on top of the surface. And then there are two video cameras that are capturing the, the distortions of that line as the scanner moves across the surface. So this information, this video information, it's uh, then converted into actual 3D uh, data. Here you can see one of the early prototypes uh, projecting the laser line on top of a surface. And then you can see there are two small video cameras at 45 degrees that are uh, recording this information. So this is the type of um, video that we are capturing, frames of the different shape of the line. And then it is possible to convert that into a 3D model. So as an example, the Lucida scanner was done to record, was created to record this type of surfaces. So different um, difficulties that you can find when you are recording um, a, a painting, normally with cracks on the surface, with a combination of dark and light areas, with um, different combination of color, and monochrome areas. So all this information, it's usually very difficult to capture by any other 3D scanner. And this is why in 2011, we decided to create the Lucida scanner precisely to be able to obtain good information of this type of materials. When recording a surface like this, what we want is that the scanner ignores the color 
and focuses on capturing the actual topography of the object. So this is the information that we can obtain with the Lucid scanner. If you compare with the actual object, you can see that there is no color information. It's just about the relief. It's just about the texture of the surface. So this level of detail that I can show you here in this, uh, in this another example, it is what we are obtaining for the last 10 years. We have been applying it for recording hundreds of paintings in different museums in the world, recording panel paintings, recording canvas, um, maps, frescoes, all types of materials and different techniques, because it is through the surface of things that we can really understand the way something has been aging over time, the way it has been taken care of, how it has been restored, how it has been preserved. And it is one type of analysis that it's normally associated with uh, recording sculptures. When you talk about 3D scanning, you don't really think initially about, about paintings because, because paintings are usually considered something flat, something that has only two dimensions. But we really want to focus on the idea that paintings or any flat work of art in general, it really contains elements of relief. It really can be understood as a proper um, sculpture, as if it was really a three-dimensional object. Uh, one example of how we, are, how we have been applying this technology, which is the same scanner that we used for the tapestry at the Cheney Foundation, it's, um, it's also related to tapestries and is the work that we in the Factum Foundation were doing a few years ago in the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. To show you very quickly this uh, project, it was about recording the uh, incredible surface of this series of seven cartoons made, made by Raphael as sketches for tapestries, sketches for the series of tapestries that are now, for example, in the Sistine Chapel or in the Palazzo Ducale in Mantua or in the Royal Palace in Madrid. It's the series of tapestries about the lives of St. Peter and St. Paul. So, the sketches that uh, were necessary for creating the tapestries are now part of the Victoria and Albert collection in London. They actually belong uh, to the Queen of, uh, of England, but basically this is where they are kept in permanently. What we did was to apply the Lucida 3D scanner for recording the surface. So it was necessary to work with the museum so they could remove the glass and the frame so that the whole surface was exposed for 3D scanning. And then we were combining the recording of the 3D texture with composite photography. So very similar to the same techniques and the same approach that we were applying for the tapestry. Thanks to this recording that was done also as part of a conservation process that they were doing to the tapestries more or less at the same time as Factum was recording them, it made possible to look at the surface with this level of detail. So by combining the two layers of information, the color on one hand and the 3D relief on the other, it is possible to navigate on the screen of your computer, for example, through every single inch of the tapestry of the cartoon by looking at the color and the relief independently or in combination. You can see, for example, here that um, this series of pouncing marks that are following the contours of the drawing, which are in a way uh, giving us the clue about um, the possible copies that this cartoon have been have been made making possible. Uh, it is really visible when you remove the color, when you are looking at the surface only from the three-dimensional point of view. And this is where you can really begin to understand the, uh, the cartoons in this case from a truly material point of view. You are not looking just at the image that is represented here. It's not just you know, the head of St. Peter here, for example. It is the series of papers that are overlapped together 
it is the wrinkles that have been generated over the centuries, and it is, of course, this series of pouncing marks that become really evident. And then if you are a researcher, if you are an expert trying to look and to learn more about these objects, if you want to go through this information, it is something that you don't really, you cannot really do in front of the originals. This type of 3D recording and color recording allows a much closer engagement with the object, uh, which is not possible if you are a visitor to the museum. It is only possible if you are really close to it, if you have some special access to it. But then, since we created this project, the Victoria and Albert Museum has put all this information, exactly what I am showing you now, available on their website so that anyone can um, inspect with the highest detail every single uh, square centimeter of the cartoons and then understand better what they are made of. In fact, after we were doing this project with the cartoons, we became more and more interested with tapestries. And this is something that um, we have been trying to find what is the best way of recording the surface of a tapestry. So going to Mantua, we had the opportunity of recording one of the tapestries that they have in the Palazzo Ducale. In this case, we were using photogrammetry. So we were not still using a scanner like the Lucida scanner for capturing the full area of the tapestry. But still, we use the Lucida scanner just for a small, just for one square meter of the tapestry to have like a first test of how it is to record with a system like Lucida that has been designed for the surface of a panel painting or a canvas painting, how it is, what, it, what is like the information that you can obtain out of the fabric of a tapestry. And you can see that thanks to this type of recording, by removing the color, you can get to really understand what is the threads that are actually forming the texture of the fabric. You can then put the color on top. And for example, you can compare this same detail with that of the cartoon that we recorded in London. So there is always this, um, um, infinite connections that you can establish. If you are recording a cartoon that you know it gave way to a tapestry, and then if you have the opportunity of recording both objects that are separate in space, that are normally never uh, placed together to compare uh, one by one, um, to compare them side by side, then thanks to these recordings, it is possible to, to do exactly what I'm doing here. For example, taking this detail of the tapestry, and comparing with the same detail of the cartoon, obviously rotated like, um, like mirror, because the cartoon is always mirrored in relation to the tapestry. So then when we discussed with, the, with our colleagues in archive and with the Fondazione Cini about how to continue this recording, not only of the buildings on the island, not only of the monuments, uh, at an architectural level, but also to focus more and more on the actual art collection of the Chini, because we want to understand this um, idea as uh, something that should go running from all different types of scales, all different types of sizes. So talking about tapestries, these ones, which are one of the, of the main uh, one of the main ones from the collection of tapestries, the entry into Palestine of the army of Vespasian and Titus, this Franco-Flemish tap uh, tapestry, it was the obvious choice because this is one tapestry of a series that will uh, probably need um, some restoration work. It will be necessary to um, carry out some conservation if it was necessary to have them on display to the public again because it's not the same to have tapestries on storage properly preserved than if you want to actually hang them or present them to the public view somehow. So before any restoration process is um, applied to this tapestry, it was proposed that we should carry out a detailed recording in 3D and color. Um, this, um, specific 
tapestry actually is believed to be the right hand side of uh, of a piece in which the left side it's actually in the museum of decorative arts in lyon but the one in the chini the one in venice it's uh, the one that was used for this uh, initial recording and one of the first time we recorded tapestries with the with this high level of resolution it is probably the first time that anyone has ever recorded a tapestry with this um, area with this uh, huge surface with a resolution of 100 microns so the lucida scanner is capable of obtaining uh, resolution of the 3d information of uh, 100 microns which is one point of information every tenth of a millimeter it, it was necessary to think a specific methodology for recording the tapestry so instead of recording the object vertically we had to we decided to extend the um, tapestry on top of a protective uh, surface on the floor in one of the spaces in archive and then modify the lucida scanner in a way that it could span the whole uh, length of the tapestry we are talking about between four and four and a half and five meters long uh, bridge like structure in which we can fix the lucida scanner two units of the lucida scanner so that from a constant distance facing from the top down instead of horizontally but facing uh, top down it was possible to project the line of laser covering the whole the entire surface and then um, obtaining the detail that we wanted to, to capture. The whole process took about between two and three weeks, if I remember well. It required the participation of, uh, of a big team composed by members from Factum Foundation, but also with the help of the staff in archive. And it was possible to demonstrate that uh, the 3D and color of a tapestry can be achieved um, in a reasonable amount of time with a reasonable amount of resources and then opening the door for further recordings of the Chile collections in the future. For recording the color, um, we were using the same uh, long structure that in which we were applying the Lucida scanner, but modified to place the photo camera so that we could create this idea of the composite photography. So we were shooting also uh, from top down. We were shooting um, hundreds, actually thousands of small photographs from the same distance, moving this structure um, in rows and columns until we covered the entire surface. And for the color, we were also interested not only on the front, but also of the back of the tapestry because as you will see in a minute that i will show you some examples of the results it is the back of the tapestry which contains the most vivid colors and it is through the back that you can really get to understand a little bit what must have been the colors of the front um, uh, some time ago so i will finish by showing you some examples of the results uh, of the recording of the tapestry and uh, I will show you from general images to specific details and also to try to explain you through this idea of layers of information. So we recorded the color of the front. This is just a flat representation of the color image. We recorded the 3D relief with the Lucida scanner. I will go more into detail in a second. Then we could create this combination of the flat color with the 3D relief so that we can understand the relation between color and texture. And we were also recorded the color of the back. You can already see if I compare these two images that the color of the back is something <clears throat> which really um, inspires you know, it has like even more richness than what you can um, interpret in the front side. It is one of the most exciting things when you have the opportunity of looking 
or recording at a tapestry that is not lined from behind, that you can really start to understand what must have been the colors centuries ago when it was created. So if we go into details, we can see that the color alone is giving not enough information about the materiality of the tapestry. It is thanks to combining it with the information of the 3D that you can create these uh, combinations. And then you, you start to see that the object is really about a real game of textures, different types of surfaces that are coexisting in the same object. This is a detail of the color of the back. And if we go closer with the color and also with the 3D, um, because we are using 3D relief information and we are showing it as an image. Actually, what I am showing you here is a render. It's like a simulation of the relief so that you can see the texture without using any 3D software. It is possible to play with this image and maybe increase the contrast if we wanted to understand the image even better, even with more clarity. So these type of things are possible to be done with the information captured with the Lucida scanner. The combination of color and relief at the end is what really gives you the impression as if you were in front of the original. And as we look at the color of the back, it's not only about these changes in the saturation of the color, in the richness or the depth of the color. There is also, of course, a much different structure of the threads because this is a part of the surface that was not supposed to be seen. This is a part of the tapestry that's supposed to be hidden. So in the front, you can get to see mm, in a more clean way the threads. You can even go to get a thread count. Whereas in the back, all these uh, um, threads that are you know, uh, outside the actual fabric of the tapestry, it would make uh, impossible to try to analyze something from a 3D scanning point of view. So the reason why we recorded this was mainly and mostly just to look at the color differences. If we combine side by side, color and relief on the left, and relief alone on the right, we can see examples of the different textures that are going on on the tapestry. Something like almost as if it was like different patches of materials. And it is very evident that uh, some textures are not the same as the others. All these things are just about um, spending hours and hours looking at this type of information, because especially if you are interested in tapestries or if you're an expert, uh, for example, when we were showing these images to, um, to the staff and the experts of the Fondazione Cini Institute uh, of um, Art History, I am sure they will be able to extract much more information. So showing this to uh, director Luca Massimo Barbero or to um, curator uh, Alessandro Martoni, for example, with whom we are working a lot in this type of projects. It is precisely for them, as precisely for those who have the responsibility of taking care of these objects to extract new conclusions out of this data. So the role of factum and the role of archive in general, it's about providing the information in the best possible way. And then it is for experts, uh, curators, uh, researchers, etc., to spend time studying these files and uh, really make them make this information really useful as part of a conservation, uh, as part of preparing a conservation treatment or for dissemination to a bigger audience or any other application that you can think of. All these things, for example, the parts that will need repair, the parts that will need restoration, thanks to the 3D scanning and to the color scanning, it is possible to measure them it is possible to establish a proper damage map um, only by working through the digital data. And then you can determine different layers of uh, intervention that will be needed in a tapestry like this one. Then it's not just about looking at details. You can take a look at the entire tapestry from a three-dimensional point of view, and then maybe 
start figuring out general distortions, the general changes in shape that has been that the tapestry has been experiencing over the years, over the centuries, and maybe um, yeah, establish new approaches into how these tapestries should be um, put on display in case it was necessary to have them on exhibition in the future. And then, of course, having the color recorded, it would be possible to uh, work digitally with the front, with the color of the front, trying to digitally um, recreate similar colors to what we can see on the back. So it would be possible with digital tools as part of a process of digital restoration. If this is something that the foundation, the, the Fundación Echini wants to, wants to try, it would be able to uh, establish some areas in the tapestry and then trying to see what would happen if we applied the colors that we recorded in the back to specific elements in the front. So these oranges, these greens, etc., that are lost in the front, it would maybe be recovered at least in a digital way, at least in a digital format. So just as a conclusion, and I will just, I, I want to share these images. There would be many, many more that I would like to share with you. Um, at some point, this information will probably be made accessible to the public as well. Uh, but so far as a preview, I wanted to show you these uh, examples of the details. And um, in addition to the, uh, let's say, to the standard mode of presenting the information, we were also recording the color even in higher resolution at five, uh, more than 500 dpi. So that uh, as an additional layer, we also have the color of the front and the back, even in higher resolution, almost at microscopic level. So all this information put together, all these archives that will be part of the Fondazione Cini archives, we hope they will be useful for attracting interest to these tapestries and to the art collection in general, and maybe and hopefully um, help and assist in the further preservation and conservation of the of the elements. So it is very similar. The just as a final curious uh, figure, um, I showed you earlier that the aerial photography of this region of the Teatro Verde and the Vatican chapels took about uh, 9,000 raw images. It was very similar to the number of images that were taken with the composite color system for the tapestry. So both front and back sides were recorded using more than 8,000 raw images. Because at the end, we are trying to record elements, no matter the scale, regardless of the size that they have, always trying to capture with the highest possible resolution to understand and to try to unveil uh, their historic elements and their biography and what it is important for us today. Um, thank you very much. These are the links to our websites of the three um, organizations that form Archive, and there will be much more information about this and other projects uh, to follow. So thank you very much. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you very much. It has been very interesting. And even though I've been collaborating to the projects from, a, let's say, from a well, facilitator, uh, organizational point of Absolutely. view and trying to facilitate it. So I knew, when, <laughs> of course, exactly what you you were talking about today. Uh, anyway, uh, I got some surprises <laughs> too. Thank you. I take the opportunity I'm, of thanking you and everyone in Archive for your help in making this possible. It's always a pleasure. Is there maybe somebody who would like to ask something? Uh, well, in freedom way on the chat on 
uh, Zoom or the chat of YouTube, or uh, if you would like to speak, we can of course uh, do that as well. I don't see questions now, but maybe somebody thinking about asking something. Well, I, I'm, it was very interesting to me, especially um, when you mentioned that um, digitizing this way and on different levels of um, uh, that, as you try to, to do, um, create a, like a special access to the, the cultural heritage, whether it is a tapestry or a building or the cartoons of Raphael. Um, so this um, idea of encouraging a different point of view that from um, in the reality is not possible because we cannot uh, take a ladder and climb over to the cartoons of Raphael to check the the little holes or um, also we cannot check the back of a tapestry in any way <laughs> uh, unless we are not restorers. Well, this giving the possibility to scholars uh, or also to um, curious people to give, uh, to have a special access is um, really important both for research, but also to share uh, what yeah. we have or other institutions have. At the end, yeah, you're right. I mean, we understand this as a com something complementary to having access to the original. It's not about substituting yeah. the experience of inspecting an original object. But we really believe, and I think that's part of Archive's mission, to have, let's say, uh, uh, an extra version or extra layers of information in a digital form so that you know, it can attract new interest about the originals. If someone, I don't know, has the opportunity of inspecting this information online, maybe they will be interested in them going and visit the original on site. Um, so both experiences complement each other. And we are not trying to substitute, you know, the important, the authentic experience of being in front of an original. But sometimes this type of... Uh, recording allows a more natural and maybe more immediate uh, engagement with things. I do agree. And, and well, and when you were talking about the Vatican chapels, um, of course, the aim is to um, also to maybe make more people curious about uh, the chapels, the building and the, in the area, but also, well, we don't want to substitute the, the, the visit, of course, but well, in cases as such, there is also a um, uh, conservative uh, need because of course, as you, as you pointed out, uh, the chapels are immersed uh, in the nature. They are in the trees uh, on an island facing the lagoon, actually being uh, surrounded by the, the lagoon. So with the, the breeze uh, full of salt. So we don't know exactly how long they will, they will be uh, in, this, in the face with the face they, they have now. So they will be for sure damaged a, a, a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, also, the philosophy of these chapels immersed in the in a park, in a like a small forest. Of course, it's uh, that's the aim. And so, having a uh, a document, uh, more than a document, many documents, many photographies, and three uh, D models of the of the area and the chapels. Of course, again, uh, in this case, a uh, strong. Um, and conservative purpose. Exactly, and, and it's a changing environment. I mean, not only because it's not the same to go and record in January when there is the trees are naked. There is, you know, it's nothing to do when we were back now in spring or in the summertime when, you know, the garden and the woods is completely different. So the relation of the chapels with the environment, I imagine it's something that was meant to work 
with a changing environment. And so in a way, it makes sense to have recorded them with in two extreme scenarios, one in the middle of the winter, one in the middle of the summer. And then, you know, you will be able to have uh, data from both uh, situations. Sure. Not, well, not mentioning the, well, the, the big climate change that well, can change the face of uh, our island, uh, uh, well, our world. <laughs> yeah. Of course. <laughs> Any questions? I check on YouTube as well. Well, again, there is a raised hand, Federico Potenza. I... Yes, good afternoon. Yes. Good afternoon. Um, I'm a student, uh, a postgraduate student from um, Chieti and Pescara, University of Chieti and Pescara. Um, I, I wanted to understand, uh, because at the beginning you, uh, you mentioned that you don't always use the same instruments and the same devices to record um, specific places. Um, I just wanted to know, is there a why you choose to use a specific instrument or a different hierarchy of instruments? In, in a place or um, you do that just to highlight a specific spot or um, the old place. Um, I, I just want, I was really interested in knowing mm -hmm. uh, which was the motive behind you choosing to use a, a specific instrument. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, this is actually the, the essence of our work. So, with our experience, we learned to understand that uh, there's no one system that can do everything. And it's always about understanding each project as uh, something that we start considering it almost from scratch or almost from zero and uh, trying to dev uh, devise what's going to be the most uh, specific system that will give us the best possible information. Um, when we are faced to the idea of, for example, recording the chapels here in, in San Giorgio, we know we wanted to achieve uh, precision in the measurements. So, so that means to locate very accurately the points in space. And this is why we were using one specific uh, type of LiDAR 3D scanner. Uh, we normally use a Faro scanner or a Leica, but basically these are the two main um, commercial systems that we use when we want to apply LiDAR 3D scanning. And then to complement precision, we were also looking for resolution, which is not the same because resolution is more about the amount of points of information, the density of points of 3D information. And this is why we wanted to complement with um, photogrammetry that will give us more flexibility so my colleagues using, a, I don't know, it was a Canon 5 DSR, uh, changing the lens between uh, 50 millimeters or something like that, maybe, I don't know, 24 millimeters. It was possible to uh, play a lot with the specific uh, necessities for each building, for each texture. At the end, it's uh, about um, something we can define specifically for each project we don't have a recipe for everything um, then clearly if we are talking about the tapestry or any other flat surface with relief um, we would go to something that would give us sub millimeter resolution clearly like the lucida 3d scanner and then of course high resolution photography but then even with photography we can do it uh, in parallel to the surface, if we are talking about the tapestry that has to be on the floor, or if we are recording something on the wall, like the cartoons example, it's mostly about panoramic photography. So the camera is fixed in a place in space and then shooting this uh, series of photographs from one specific point. Um, so everything it's so everything is thought and planned by looking at the object we want to record. It's not about, we have this technology, 
what can we record with it? It's quite the opposite. It's like, okay, there's the need of recording this specific object, this specific texture. How can we apply existing technology or new methods um, designed by us uh, to obtain the best possible information so that the, inf the digital data we show on a screen uh, represents as best as possible the original, uh, the original work of art. This is more or less our approach. So it's really specific. It's almost bespoke to each project. And um, it, that, this is why it is changing over, over the years and with each different project. Probably we were doing this project a few years ago. We were just using different technology. Um, and the same if we want to go back in a few years time. Thank you very much. Thank you. I see another raised hand. So please, Manuel. Yes, hi, thank you so much for your presentation. I am Manuel Vigi, I'm first year master's student at uh, Universito di Bologna, the master degree in digital humanities and digital knowledge. I'd like to ask you a question if also your mission is also uh, not only to digitalize these, um, these cultural assets, but also to enrich these digital reproduction also with metadata. And if yes, uh, how are these metadata handled? Yeah, that's a very interesting um, aspect of our work. And it especially applies to the, um, when we are, carrying out important uh, documentation projects of, uh, let's say, collections of images, collections of manuscripts, documents, things in which it's not just about the uh, recording of one particular object, but about entire collections of objects, which is basically what uh, Costanza, Elenia, et cetera, are doing in archive, then making sure that metadata is um, as as properly and as automatically saved as possible, it's part, it's part of the work. So in those cases, it is especially important to have a record not only of the things itself, but also of the data of uh, the specific settings in which they were captured. So that if you want to go back to these archives, to these files in the future, you, um, you know what you are dealing with. In, this, in the sense of these recordings, of 3D scanning that I was explaining today, uh, we keep some data, not as automatically as, uh, as we have with other systems, like the replica, for example, the replica scanner, but it is always important to keep some uh, record of how it was done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, in fact, when we were talking previously about the Vatican chapels and uh, how uh, the project and of dig digitization has a conservative um, purpose, of course, uh, also the, the, the files that we you created uh, are preserved, are stored in a with a with an eye for conservation, of course, and uh, so. The study of uh, formats and uh, metadata for uh, for storage, of course, is uh, developed uh, uh, parallelly with the recording itself. When we say digitize, of course, uh, it's just the acquisition and is part. The analysis is part. The study on the uh, well, how to store data is another one that is, of course maybe less visible, <laughs> but fundamental. Any other questions? We have still some time. And speaking of special access, since you mentioned uh, me and uh, and Elenia and uh, well <laughs> the work um, when you were talking about 
creating a special access to, to the audience, to the scholars. Uh, I was thinking that uh, just this morning uh, um, here, uh, we realized that, well, we are digitizing um, a book, a rare book of uh, Dante from 1491. And that is particularly challenging because the, the binding is pretty tight. Uh, and so it's difficult to, uh, well, even to read uh, the inner part, the part of text that is exactly in the, in the middle of the book. So uh, we asked the collaboration of um, another photographer collaborating with our usual uh, team. And, and well, so they are developing uh, a new method uh, with a different uh, lens, for example. Uh, to record the, the inner part of the, of the text of this Dante, of this Divina Commedia. And, and well, and we realized that uh, with the latest pictures that they are taking, uh, it's possible to read a part of the text that in, in the reality of things is not easily possible <laughs> so we were pretty happy about it and I, I think that we will talk about this uh, project uh, in the next month for uh, well it will be uh, another presentation of uh, archive online academy and you are all invited of course but it's not uh, it's not scheduled yet uh, also because the project is not uh, finished <laughs> and we still have to to do many tests and well, but we will back on this topic uh, from a 2D point of view <laughs> because in the lab at uh, Archive Lab in Venice, um, well, is developing more um, the recording on 2D, and I mean with. The, because yeah. in Venice yeah, we mostly. are crossing crossing experiences 2D, 3D, and uh, and well, the lab yeah. that are physically here in Venice is usually developing more on the 2D. Yeah, let's say that the regular activity of archive it's about 2D documentation. It's it's only 3D when it's specific projects like this one, but as a regular thing. Um, but this is exactly a, a great example. Sometimes uh, it's not just about you want to preserve an object is that you cannot read something if you are just using the original and you need these tools, these enhancement tools digitally to allow you to read things that otherwise it would not be possible. I think we will also be talking in one of the next sessions, um, maybe after the summer, about the another side of work of archive, but which what we are doing in Oxford. So it's like uh, inspired by the work in Venice. In Oxford, we are applying a new type of, uh, let's say, two and a half dimensions, if that is something, you know, between two and three dimensions, to recording specific elements from the collection of the Bodleian libraries. And we will have opportunity to present this to, to the people if you are interested, but this is about how to capture 3D information even in higher resolution than the Luthida scanner, so we can read text, for example, from a, from a series of Sanskrit manuscripts that maybe they have lost the ink. And it is only readable if you can record the incisions on the material. So it's a good example in which um, if you record a color photograph, you will not be able to see the text. But if you are using another type of 3D recording technology, you can reconstruct the text through um, recording the differences in depth in the material. I will prepare some question for that presentation of Archeox. You have the questions already? Yeah. Okay, very good. Well, after all, checking the surface, uh, oh, well, the surface is deep somehow. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's well, the, the conclusion results... today, I think. <laughs> But it's not a conclusion because we have uh, we have another raised hand, uh, Letizia. Hello. Good morning. Um, Please. Hello, I'm the teacher from Berlin, and uh, thank you very much for this three-day document. 
I just have a very small question. Will you open this up to the public or it only for use for the private? Thank you very much. I think it may be very useful for connect the different um, level of the society, especially for the young students. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. Um, I hope this information will be available publicly. Uh, first, we have to really finish in all the processing because it takes time to obtain final files for presentation. Then it is important that the actual managers and the team at the Chini dedicate time to inspect the information and uh, use it for their own analysis, etc. But I really hope, uh, if not all, at least part will be made public. Um, in any case, apart from the ongoing project of recording the island of San Giorgio and Venice in general, there is a lot of information about other recording projects in our websites, in the Chini website, in Factum's website, even with similar um, uh, viewers to what I've been showing you today. You can see 3D and color information from many other artworks if you are interested on understanding other approaches to, to this type of um, digital preservation idea. Uh, I also think it may be a very important step to change the tourism um, uh, environment in Venice too. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're absolutely right. Thank you. I was thinking that maybe um... The link of the tapestries is um, shareable, right? Uh, I think so. Yeah, uh, I can put it in the chat. The let's, uh, let's confirm. Let's confirm with the Art History Institute if and when they want to make it public. But okay, for, for you're right is... because yeah, from factum side, I know that it was. <laughs> That's why I, <laughs> I felt free like to do that. Well. We show it. Well, you showed how it works. I guess that in the, in the next weeks um, it will be uh, shared uh, from our website, maybe also on, on our uh, social Instagram and Facebook account. Uh, well, the, the visualize visual yeah, the viewer, visualization. How you want to call the it? Viewer, yeah. thanks. <laughs> the viewer of the high resolution uh, recording, 3D uh, color separated them together of the yeah. uh, tapestry. Okay. Stay tuned, <laughs> it will be out soon. Watch this space, yeah. <laughs> well, I think that uh, we got some interesting questions and uh, reflections. So, um, Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Carlos, of course. Uh, and thank you. Thanks to all attended, both here and on, on YouTube. So, well, I will invite you uh, to the next um, appointment. The next uh, presentation will be uh, on the 23rd of, um, of June. It will, it will be a presentation uh, connected to the uh, new profession, uh, digital professions uh, related with um, digital exhibit uh, um, for museums, uh, institutions, uh, and and well, the description, of course. Uh, since you are you enrolled in this course, of course, you know more or less everything about the next uh, presentation. But this was just a reminder. Thank you very much and have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you for your organization. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you. bye.